Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for tonight's rainwater harvesting program. Uh, my name is Patrick Dickinson. We also have Daniel Cunningham on the call as well, who will be monitoring questions and comments as we go through the program this evening. Um, some housekeeping, just real quick housekeeping things. On the top right of your screen, you will see a camera icon as well as a microphone icon. Everybody is automatically muted when you join the program, and we will be able to unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself when we get to the questions. But if everybody will click to make sure that your cameras are off, that way we don't get any glitches uh, with tonight's program and me sharing my screen for you and the information. The other thing is, as we go throughout the program, we're gonna stop a couple of times to answer questions. And of course, we will answer questions at the end of the program as well. Um, and at that point, you'll um, there's a little emoji icon at the top where you're able to kind of do a hand raise up and let, you, let us know that you have a question. When I stop, then Daniel will be able to um, get you unmuted and you can answer the question and we can answer it back to you. There's also the chat box if you'd like to chat in there. Uh, Daniel will be on there during the program and helping out answer questions. So uh, again, thank you all for joining. <clears throat> We're very excited to be partnering again uh, with the City of Grand Prairie, wonderful organization. Um, and wonderful people that are managing your water conservation programs there. Uh, we've had a very long standing relationship with them and we hope that that continues. I um, mean, also we'll have some information um, at the end as well as about your rain barrel pickup, which will be Saturday morning for you to go pick those up. Um, so uh, if you have questions about that, please hold those to the end. We'll have information for you as well on that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I do have my, my tea and everything. So. Um, so moving on, just if you want to reach out to us uh, in the future, our website is rootedin.com. Very easy. Um, some of y'all may be familiar with our faces and our names from a previous organization we were with. We were with. Um, now we are our own private organization. Um, our social media is all rooted in TX, and my social media is Plant with Patrick. Uh, and if you want Daniel, Daniel's is TX Plant Guy. You can't miss us on all major social media outlets. We're going to be posting a lot of helpful videos and pictures. Um, I just kind of shared a funny one about uh, brown plants. Um, you'll have to see it. It's a little fun meme um, that I posted about the brown plants and people asking us about the brown plants. But we're here to answer any questions for you tonight uh, regarding rainwater harvesting. Anything beyond that, just please reach out to us via email or our social media, and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Rainwater harvesting is something that has not just be a, a passion of all of ours on the Rooted In team, uh, but it's become a little bit of an addiction, but we call it a healthy addiction. Um, and rain barrels, so many people say, well, what is a rain barrel going to do? Well, you're right. A 55-gallon rain barrel is not necessarily going to save all of us a ton of water. In the long run, yes, it will. But it's also a behavioral change. Um, so many people, you know, just uh, underappreciate the water that comes out of the tap as the magical water that will always come out. But when they do rainwater harvesting and they use that water in their barrel and they see how quickly that water can go, they quickly realize that some of their watering habits maybe were a little bit abundant um, and they put a new value on water. And that's what this is. It's about behavioral change. Um, my, myself, my colleagues, we all have rain barrels at our home. Um, I even have a water feature. Yes, a water feature by my front door that's in the shade. Um, it waters all my pollinators and even the squirrels, as much as, as much as I don't want their destruction. But I fill that rain, I use that rain barrel on the corner of my home to fill the water feature. That's the only water I use in it. And the wildlife does know the difference. It's pretty, um, pretty interesting when you see the wildlife um, and how they come to that water feature. But we open up the program. We always kind of have to stop and talk about the state of water in Texas. Why is it so important for us to be speaking about water efficiency? And you hear me saying water efficiency a lot not water conservation, um, because we're not telling you not to use your water. We're just telling you we want you to be as efficient as possible with your water. So how many of y'all were in the area and remember 2014, the, the big last major drought that we experienced? Um, and, you know, it, we started out our summer, this was May of 2014, looking pretty bleak. Things were pretty dry. Um, one of the biggest coefficients we look at when we look at drought is soil moisture, and we weren't seeing a lot of that at that time. But then the rain started um, and we it quickly entered, we had a little bit of rain that July. Um, so we ended our summer better than we started our summer. And then 2015 happened and we quickly went to zero residents in the state of Texas under a drought, but that changed quickly. So from July to about mid-October, the rain stopped. We had you know, record-breaking rain from February all the way through June. It stopped July to September and we quickly went back to this drought map. 
um, where we went to a significant amount of this the Texan residents in some form of a drought. The rain started back up again in October. Our holidays looked really good. And I still tell people, in a lot of ways, I feel like we're still benefiting from the floods of 2015. You know, some parts of the state were averaging 70 inches of rainfall. Um, and that is, that's much, that's almost double. Um, well, I think it is double our average rainfall in North Texas. Um, so we were seeing tremendous flooding at that time. And then we've had kind of strategic rainfall ever since then that's kind of helped fill the gaps. So we are still benefiting from this. Um, who knows if it'll happen again, but here we are, 2021, and we've just had a record-breaking freeze. Um, Snowmageddon, as a lot of you like to talk about it. So um, we, we'll, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. We're not going to you know, talk about necessarily the climate change and things, but we're just going to say there's a warming pattern happening. Things are changing across the globe. When you look at the map of all of our water supply in the state of Texas, this is all of our what's called surface water um, or reservoirs in the state of Texas. And they're all man-made with the exception of one, Cattle Lake, which is on our eastern border. And we share it with Louisiana, so we can only pull so much water from it at a time because it's a natural wildlife refuge. But we kind of flipped our water cycle in a lot of ways as far as where we get our water from. And we depend heavily now, especially in North Texas, on this surface water, where below in the southern part of the state, they rely more on the groundwater like aquifers to get their water. Um, but it's still all affected by um, our water cycle, our consumption. <clears throat> um, that percentage is actually not updated, but I'd have to tell you the new one. Um, the picture on the left is actually Lake Levon. This was Lake Levon 2014. The picture on the right is Lake Levon 2015. To give you a little idea for uh, those of y'all uh, in the room that aren't familiar with Lake Levon, it is up in the North Texas Municipal Water District, which is city of Frisco, Allen, McKinney, all those cities that depend heavily on that lake or reservoir as their water source. But the big thing we really look at is population growth. This is why we really need to focus on our efficiency in the landscape, especially because we estimate that our populations, about probably 27, 29 million people in the state of Texas, that's expected projections to go up to possibly 54, maybe more million by 2060. Um, a lot of people say, I won't see that in my lifetime. Well, look at it just in 2030. We're less than 10 years away from that. So it's, it's a lot uh, of information, a lot of people coming into the state um, especially with large corporations moving here. Uh, we've seen quite a few of those over the past five years. And then you look at our water supply and how that's dropped from 17.8 million acre feet to 14.6. So why would our water supply drop when our population is going to possibly double in the state of Texas? Well, it has a little thing to do with something called sedimentation. The floors of our lakes are slowly rising. It's uh, it, sedimentation buildup. It's a natural process. It happens all over the world. We just speed it up at a very rapid rate because of what we allow to go down those storm drains, which then filter into our reservoirs, which a lot of times is a lot of herbicides, oil from your vehicles, um, and pure sedimentation. The floor is rising. It's holding less water. And then when we look at our water supply as a whole, um, we used to, and why, let's talk about why the flooding has become so much more substantial. And it's because we've increased the velocity of water. We've also decreased how, how much water we're allowing to absorb into the ground. We used to absorb about half of our rainfall into the ground, only diverting about 10 to 15 percent to fill up reservoirs um, or small reservoirs like uh, ponds, not really big reservoirs like we have now. Well, Pave Paradise put up a parking lot. We're now absorbing 10 to 15 percent and diverting over 50% to fill up those reservoirs. You can see how I said we've kind of flipped things. Well, and this is also how we've increased the velocity of the water. So when you see the highways flooding and when you see a neighborhoods flooding, it's because of the backup and the velocity and the amount of water that's hitting impervious surfaces and accumulating. We as homeowners actually contribute to this the greatest. And it's because I say in so many of our programs, we're marketed very well. We're marketed very well as to what ant killer, weed killer, uh, um, fertilizers to put out on our lawns. Well, if you're not using those products properly, they could be leaching or washing off of your lawn, your soil, into our reservoirs, and we do look at water quality. And I will tell you, some of it's pretty alarming what they find in our water. And then, of course, picking up after your pets. How many of y'all do have pets? Well, about uh, 72.8 million uh, dogs in the United States alone 
40% of Americans do not pick up after their dogs. Our natural ecosystem can handle the waste of two dogs per square mile. We average about 125 dogs per square mile. Everything you try to keep out of your kitchen, salmonella, E. coli, all that is on their waste. Pick it up, dispose of it. Do not leave it down as fertilizer. Um, don't, uh, uh, because it'll leach out of our soil or leach off of our soil into our storm drains. And that's where we get all that contamination. So we can actually find that nasty fecal matter in our water. So let's try to help mitigate that. And then this is the other part, why we have to be so efficient. Think of that population growth I just talked about. 54 million people and over possibly 50 to 70% of our municipal water in North Texas ends up outdoors. Water that was filtered and treated for our consumption, our bathing, our medical, is now going outdoors. And as horticulturalists, we're here to tell you that should not be the case. If you are planting the right plants and you're managing them properly, we have a whole series of programs that we offer from the right plants to the in the right place to rainwater harvesting, to lawn care, vegetable gardening, grow your own food. We have a whole series of programs. We hope we st that you stick with us and take this knowledge and expand upon it because this is just one piece of the puzzle to really have that efficient landscape and be efficient and sustainable in your own home, your little micro environment, protect it. But we also need to remember for those of y'all that do have automatic sprinklers or for those of y'all that do still have the John Deere tractor at the end of the water hose uh, running down and watering your landscape, irrigation supplements the lack of rainfall, not the other way around. So when we do have substantial rainfall, your irrigation should not be going off. My irrigation system has been off since about October. It's still not on. And I don't see uh, in the near future the need to turn it back on. Our temperatures are still very nice. I don't know if y'all were outside today, but it was gorgeous. And then we got so much rainfall last night. There's no need for your sprinklers. You need to be paying attention to your soil moisture. But where does rainwater harvesting play a factor in this? How can that help mitigate that 50 to 70%? Well, it's the behavior change. The picture you see right here is a thousand gallon cistern that my colleagues and I installed. Um, I guess it's been about nine years now. Um, and it's still functioning and still being used for the irrigation system around this home. That is a larger tank system. A thousand gallons, as you can see, is not near as intimidating as you would think when I say a thousand gallons. It's about five and a half feet wide by six and a half feet tall. Not that big. And it can become a beautiful focal point in your landscape. The rainwater harvesting, we're going to remove the intimidation out of this for you. Rainwater harvesting is simple. It's capturing the water on your roof, diverting it either through the valleys of your roof if you don't have gutters, or in your gutters and downspouts, and storing it for future use. Rainwater has no expiration date, so it can be used at any time. It reduces the demand on the municipal water supply by you cutting down on how much water you're taking from it to use outdoors. Rainwater is the best form of water for your uh, plants, so you're making a, a use of that valuable resource. And if you have a flooding erosion problem around your home, it actually can slow down that velocity of water and help uh, reduce, if not eliminate, those erosion problems. But the big thing, the big hook, you know, I can say we're saving water all day long, but if I don't tell you you're saving money, then we're not, that's not the hook. But you are saving money. That behavior change reduces your water bill because you start putting that value on the water that it should have and you're using that rain barrel or you're upgrading to a larger cistern to use on your vegetable garden and outdoors. Um, who wouldn't like to see this cloud of cash raining over their house right now? I know I would. So we've been doing this for thousands of years. This is a sixth century castle um, and in the base of it is still a functioning cistern. You can see at the top there's modern plumbing um, and bracing, and we can appreciate that. But it's still collecting um, and water and being used today uh, for things like the plumbing in the home and for fountains and things. Romans 2,000 years ago were harvesting rainwater, and they built them underneath their road systems. You can see on the picture on the right how they would have had pavings or pavers over it, and they actually drove over, they disguised them under the road system. You can still go down and tour some of them today. Um, and they're still functioning, they're still harvesting, overflowing and functioning uh, like proper rain cisterns today. Mayans um, used to hollow out cave systems and harvest water. Obviously the stair system is new, but you get the idea. And then in, in, in Istanbul, you can actually, underneath the city is a labyrinth of cisterns uh, where you can actually go take a tour down in there. They have an opera house. Uh, down in there because the acoustics are so perfect that they have a symphony and opera down in the 
um, cisterns and they have little bridges and walkways you can walk around in. Um, it's very, very fascinating. And more modern systems, this is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in downtown Seattle, um, that even though they get about the same amount of average rainfall we do, they get it kind of um, spread out over a longer period of time where ours tends to come down all at once. So irrigation for them is not always a, ne a necessity, but they harvest rainwater on this building, a million gallons. It looks like a parking garage, but you see how shiny those walls are. They use it for their green roofs, their outdoor landscape, um, and, and they don't have to use the municipal water supply for that. My colleague Daniel got to travel to Africa and show them how to harvest rainwater and grow crops that before generations before them never had the pleasure of eating. Uh, so they, you know, he was working on that um, during his master's program. And then other parts of the world, rainwater harvesting in the water cycle is basic curriculum. You know, I, I talked to my nieces and my nephew and I talked to other people with their kids and grandkids. And I asked them, how many of y'all have the, in your curriculum has water cycle? And they said, yeah, we talked about that. We saw the map it. we really didn't talk any more about that. And I said, okay, how many of y'all talked about rainwater harvesting? And it was just dead silence. It's not basic curriculum. And that's something we really should be doing because that is our, our, our great and our primary source of water. So we should be bringing that back. We have done some school gardens that built in um, some large cisterns um, over our careers. And that's been very rewarding. And they're still using it and doing their own school vegetable gardens and herb gardens and things of that nature. So let's talk about the quality of water and capturing that rainwater. The quality of the water is the most important part for your plants. You can see here in this picture, she's using what's called a down downspout diverter. Um, it's a very inexpensive, less than $10 product, comes in all different colors, that actually is a plastic piece that connects onto your downspout so that you can redirect the water wherever you need to do. This takes a lot of the guessing out of how do I put that downspout back together to, together to get water into my barrel. And there's even open top systems like you see here where if you don't have gutters, and downspouts, the water simply can pour onto the open of the barrel. Um, and that requires a little bit more elbow grease and drilling to get that top off. But the benefits is the water quality. And we tell people as long as your water is coming out clear on your rain barrel, there's really no need to empty or clean out your rain barrel. I have never emptied or cleaned out my rain barrel on this house and we're six years in this home now. So that water, as long as you're gonna get some a little debris, but as long as it's coming out clear, there's no reason to clean it out. That water is salt free and calcium and lime free, kind of like the white crusty buildup you can get on shower heads and faucets. You don't get that with rainwater. It's slightly acidic. It sits below seven where our soil is very alkaline. So it does serve a purpose for that. But you have to remember the water is going to come out as clear as it goes in. So we have to try to do some type of pre-filtering, and that's where the netting is uh, involved in the front. And even on larger cisterns, we do something called a first flush system, uh, but we won't get into that. But if you're interested, we do the large tank class as well. And maybe you get into the rain barrel and you decide you wanna graduate up to that thousand gallon cistern. A little bit different engineering of collecting the water, but still super uh, simple like doing a rain barrel. You also have to remember all the little critters and the birds going across your roof and the little gifts they're leaving you on your roof. So, and you know, you get the, we're right now we're getting the blooms from the oaks all over our roof and all over our cars. So that is why um, we wanna make sure that when we're collecting rainwater, we're allowing dirty things like that to get filtered off of our barrel before it gets in our barrel. Clean out your gutters. And you can see here the valley of your roof, make sure that that avenue, that pathway is clear of debris so the water can travel um, into your rain barrel. There's a big push for green roofs, but we're not talking about that right now. Um, and we're also not talking about drinking water because of all those potential contaminants like the squirrels and the birds leaving you your gifts. So this is not a potable uh, a class on rainwater harvesting. That requires quite a bit more where we get into UV light, uh, reverse osmosis, all that different stuff. We're not talking about that today. So please don't drink out of your rain barrel, um, but it's perfect for your plants and even your vegetables and things that won't harm Harm them as harm them at all. There are stickers like this you can buy at most hardware stores or even online if you feel comfortable uh, putting on your barrel just as a precaution. Um, but I will tell you the state of Texas has already designated rainwater harvesting as a private water supply. Um, so you are not liable should somebody come and drink out of your rain barrel. Now, where to use your rainwater? Uh, number one, irrigation being the number one, meaning outdoor watering. Foundation watering, we know people, especially in areas where uh, water restrictions are a little more severe um, and out west, 
They'll use uh, rain barrels with drip irrigation to water their foundations during really dry times. House plants. House plants are a very. Uh, how many of y'all might be house plant addicts like me? You got quite a bit, quite a few in the in the windows. Well, how many of y'all experience things like this? The burnt edges and the burnt tips. Yes, some of your plants, the burnt tips and things could be lack of humidity. And that's why we missed a lot of our plants so that we do get the humidity in there. Well, this also can be a sign of things like salt. And we talked about how salt and chlorine that is in our tap water on low, very low amounts that doesn't harm us, but plants don't really like it. They have a very, very simple type system that um, uh, pushes that water through the plant. And so you can get those burnt tips and burnt edges that way. Um, if, if you are misting and doing the humidity, but I'll tell you, since watering with rainwater on my indoor plants, I don't have this problem anymore. And I do not mist my indoor plants. Ponds, um, if you have a koi pond or something like that. Aquariums, if you have uh, natural, you know, freshwater aquariums and terrariums. I have terrariums that I put rainwater in. And of course I don't have to add any more because they're raining on themselves. And then bird baths. Remember I talked about how wildlife knows the difference with bird baths. You can see here all these cedar wax wings swarming this rain barrel that was overflowing um, with the rainwater because they knew the difference. Um, and the person who sent this photo to us up in McKinney, you can see she wasn't quite done setting up her barrel when the rain came. She said, I had just cleaned out and filled up my bird bath right next to the rain barrel. And she said, not one of those birds was on my bird bath. They were all on the rainwater on her barrel. Pet water bowls. My dog actually goes outside to drink out of her water bowl, um, especially when it's been raining um, and the water bowl has been filled up naturally on its own. She'll go out there. Wildlife guzzlers. We put these on ranches where we put many roofs or off of a, a shed or a barn to collect that. Uh, for livestock and then firefighters a lot of volunteer firefighters will have cisterns on their buildings to collect that rainwater to use for firefighting so when we're looking at how much rainwater we can actually calculate we need to look at what's called the footprint of your building um, and that's something that i need you to think about so start thinking about you know if you're on a one-story home what's the square footage of your home that gives you a general footprint of your home if you're on a two-story um, home what's the kind of the footprint or square footage of your roof um, and that's something you need to think about. It doesn't matter the pitch, the style, or the material um, of your uh, rain or of your, excuse me, of your roof. It's all going to fall in the same space. That's why we call it the footprint. So you need to think about that square footage. And if you want to um, uh, actually get up or uh, look at plans of your home, a lot of people will get on Google Earth and look at their square footage. So think about that for just a second. And now I want you to calculate that number by 0.6. So what that 0.6 rep represents is how much rain uh, that you will get in a one inch rainstorm per square foot of that footprint. So if you have a 2000 square foot home in a one inch rainstorm, you're looking at about 1200 gallons of water in that storm. Multiply that by an average of 32 inches of rain a year, you're looking at 38,000 plus gallons of rainfall or rain a year. Think that's enough for your landscape? We sure hope so. It's enough for your landscape. And the other thing is you're not going to be collecting every drop off of your roof. Hopefully you're not going to have cisterns on all four corners of your home that collect all that water. We want you to focus on isolated areas or corners where that you need the water the most. Because one of the things you're going to find out is these 55 gallon barrels, even with a misting or a sprinkle outside, they will overflow. You now know how many gallons of water are hitting your roof during a one inch rainstorm, which we get very easy here in North Texas. So think of now of a 55 gallon barrel in that equation. It's gonna fill up and overflow before you know it. So you don't have to try to uh, put a rain barrel in all four corners of your home. One corner is enough. Now, capturing that rainwater. Here's the complexity of rainwater harvesting. I need you to listen really hard right now. You gotta get the water in the barrel. That's the simplicity of it. So if you have gutters and downspouts, as you see from these pictures, it's simply directing the water to pour onto your barrel. If you don't have gutters and downspouts, you have what's called the valley of your roof, where all the water comes barreling off in a storm, hits one part in your ground, that's where you need to put your barrel. You're gonna get a lot more splashing than people that have downspouts and gutters, but that's all right. Um, it's just a little bit of water, but that's how you capture rainwater. We don't connect to the barrel. The reason we don't want to connect to the barrel and we want the water just to pour in there is we don't want to open up a pipeline 
to mosquitoes and rodents, things like that that could get inside your barrel. So we don't actually hardline onto the barrel. We'll do a little bit of that with larger cisterns, um, but even a 1,000, 2,500 gallon cistern, we're just trying to pour the water into the barrel. That way your barrel acts as its own closed protected system. I mean, you're protecting it from the uh, mosquitoes and rodents. You can't forget about those too because they can climb into different pipes. So now I'm gonna talk about how we set up um, our barrels, how we uh, prep them for them, and how you're going to receive your barrel. But I thought this is kind of a good halfway point um, in case any of y'all have any questions so far. You can hit that emoticon up on the top right and just kind of do the hand raising um, so that we can see that you have a question. Um, and then we can call on you and answer that question for you. Daniel, are you there? All right. So okay. we are looking for questions um we have clark who has a question and clark uh you can go ahead and unmute yourself now by hitting the microphone button and ask your question to patrick hi guys can you hear me we can hi the great class so far lots of really good information um, just a quick question on the water barrel overflowing. So mm -hmm. um, I guess it's a two-part question. So how far away should the water barrel be from the actual structure from the house? Because I'm just wondering if it's going to overflow. Is that going to create a bunch of any kind of foundation problems? Or is it going to create like a, like a start digging a hole? <laughs> with <the actual barrel? laughs> Well, it Yes, Maybe you can it, elaborate for me. Thanks. Yeah, and it, it absolutely can um, kind of dig a hole. And um, But here's the thing is, and we'll talk about overflow in just a second. You really need to look at the pitch and the grade as to where the rain barrel is going to be. My rain barrels are right next to my house, and I have the downspouts directly uh, diverted into the or to pour onto the barrels. But I also have an even pitch on either side of my home. So when they do overflow, they overflow out of the netting, and the water drains away from my home. If you don't have that, we're going to talk about overflow pipes that you can connect onto your rain barrel to redirect that water away from your home. Um, some people even have their downspouts that connect into a drain system um, on the side of their home, and they've actually redirected that downspout to pour into their barrel, and then they put the overflow on the barrel and then put it down into that drain system so it drains away from their home. So that's the part that's going to require a little bit of thought on your part uh, based okay. on your home and the grade around it. Okay, and maybe just one other question. So sure. um, uh, when you talk about these valleys, so um, we have a very a two story, very steep pitched house. And even though we have gutters um, everywhere and drain spouts everywhere, they seem to run off the back of the house for some reason. Um, and it really just comes flooding down. Um, I don't know, is it, we need to maybe install extra drain it like what do you call the what do you call the gutters i mean gutters are around the house right what is the what do you call that downspouts downspout so do we need to maybe install a, an additional downspout um, well that could be a possibility yeah Pardon? so um one of the things you can do and, and we'll talk about this with uh, servicing your gutters um so many people don't realize that gutters over time because they're thin aluminum um, right. can, and the weight of water and the weight of debris, they can get sags. Um, and a lot of times also, if, if it wasn't um, engineered or calculated properly, you may not have enough downspouts. You may not have enough mm -hmm. guttering around certain parts of your roof. And a guttering company should be able to look at that and figure that out. Um, okay. So I would call a guttering company, tell them the problems you're having um, so that they can make recommendations based on what you should do. Okay, thanks very much. No problem. Okay. Well, we'll probably have more after we get through the setup and the makeup of your barrels. So that works out. All right. Okay. Well, you ready to just move on? We're ready. All right. So now we're going to talk about and really go through how we engineered and make up our barrels. Um, and this is going to be exactly like the barrels that you will be receiving, um, all the parts and components that we currently use. Um, and we do this exactly. So your barrels, when you receive them on Saturday, are already gonna be assembled. And that is just another one of the costs of the pandemic right now is normally our rain barrel classes, you come to the class, we have them pre-drilled and you get to assemble them in the class. Well, we can't do that right now. So we are gonna have them pre-assembled for you. 
Um, and that is actually uh, something we worked on last week was getting all the barrels drilled. So we actually do all this work ourselves. Um, it's become a little bit of a pattern for us. So we kind of get into our groove when we start drilling. Um, but your barrels um, come to us just like this. Um, you'll notice they are white. Um, there are different reasons that the, in, the, the industries that we get these from have gone to a white barrel and they also don't have removable lids on them anymore where they used to. But we get all of our barrels from a food beverage grade company in a partnership with them. Um, so we don't necessarily tell you where the barrels come from, but the game is when you get your barrels, smell the inside and guess your beverage <laughs> because you can always uh, recognize some of those sweet smells that are in the barrels. Um, but this is what they'll come like uh, when you pick them up. Um, we have different um, uh, machinery that we use. We use hand drills and jigsaws. Uh, jigsaws with a PVC blade on them cut through these barrels like butter. Um, so it works really well. Just had to make sure you have that PVC blade. And then we use spade bits and hole bits, and I'll show you how we use those as well. Your bulkhead fitting is a one and three quarter inch bulkhead fitting. Um, and then we also have a three quarter inch brass faucet uh, that goes into that bulkhead fitting. And of course the faucet, we also wrap with Teflon tape like you would do any other plumbing um, to try to avoid any extra drips that might come out of that. Now the top of your barrel where we have the opening, we use a mosquito insect grade netting. Um, you'll find this in hardware stores where there's windows and screening material. Uh, you find it by the roll. Uh, you can't buy it by the piece. It comes by the roll. Um, and this is what we adhere to the top of your barrel using a uh, what's what they call typically um, like a trim type caulking. And it's got the acrylic, the latex, and the silicone in it. And we use clear. So when you put it on there, it's going to go on white, but it dries clear. So by the time you get them on Saturday, they will be completely dried. And then some of the additional items that we put on here um, is like the bungee cords and the cinder blocks. The bungee cords are really if you're going to have an open top system. So if you want to cut off the whole top of your barrel um, to do an open top system, you would need to put the mosquito netting all the way across and then the bungee cord on that to hold it in place. That is not something we pre-drill these barrels for. Like I said, it's a little bit more involved to cut off the top of that barrel. But if you have more questions, we're happy to uh, answer those for you. All these barrels kind of have a lip around them. You can see in this picture, they kind of have a lip. Um, and that is where we'll cut on the inside of that lip. That way, if you fold that mosquito netting over, the bungee cord fits right underneath that lip and holds it in place. And then cinder blocks we use for elevating our barrels, and I will show you that and why uh, here shortly. So that's really your material list. Um, and it's very simple process. Um, it doesn't take very long at all to do that. This is how your barrels arrive to us. We go and pick them up with our partnership with the beverage company um, and a large Penske truck. And then we bring them back and um, we all look like we're throwing bale, hay's of, uh, bales of hay and throw those barrels off. And then we get to drilling. And what we start with, we learned very quickly, is we need a five to six inch hole in the top of the barrel. We do have a template that we've made from other barrels. A one gallon container works. And we actually make a, a template. We draw a circle. We learned that we need to do that because none of us could really drill a perfect circle with a jigsaw. So we had to make that template because we had things that look like jelly beans and um, other things. So, um, And then we drill a pilot hole in that so that we can then get our jigsaw blade down into the barrel. And then, like I said, that jigsaw blade with a PVC blade on it, we cut all the way around. Yes, I know I need to be wearing gloves, but I do not have gloves on when I was taking these pictures. Um, and then we're able to cut the top off. All the tops of these barrels, we do our best to recycle um, or repurpose. So uh, we take those off from there. And now you have your five to six inch hole um, where we're gonna put the netting for the water to go into your barrel. But we also need to drill our hole at the bottom of the barrel for our bulkhead fitting. Now, you'll notice here that it's about two to three inches off the bottom of the barrel. We don't wanna go too high so we can't get the water below it. We also don't wanna to go too low because you will get sedimentation in the bottom of your barrel. Sedimentation is not a bad thing. Sedimentation can act like a biofilter. It has beneficial bacteria. Again, the key is that your water still keeps coming out clear. Um, but we do the whole bit on here. That way we can then feed because your bulkhead fitting comes in two pieces and one part goes in from the inside. Well, these barrels are three feet tall and our arms are not three feet long. So we did this for you because it was a very complicated system and we had to get a yardstick with duct tape. And we feed the bulkhead fitting through the bottom of the barrel, as you can see here. And then we are then able to put the additional rubber washer 
and the nut on the outside of the bulkhead fitting. We put a washer on the inside and the outside of the barrel. You thread that on. Now here's the kicker. Notice at the top of the screen, it says twist left. Your bulkhead fittings are opposite threading. You've all heard righty tighty, lefty loosey. Well, these are righty loosey, lefty tighty. Can you say that 10 times fast? That's how many years we've been doing this. So the reason for that is we're now gonna put your faucet and thread that into the inside of your bulkhead fitting. And if they were both threaded the same way, we'd be loosening one while we were tightening another. So your bulkhead fitting does have to be uh, uh, threaded opposite. And as we tighten down the faucet, we're tightening the bulkhead fitting at the same time. So we put the Teflon tape on clockwise onto our uh, faucet. That way it doesn't unravel as we're twisting it in there. And then we very carefully get the faucet started. You have to remember these bulkhead fittings, they're very rigid plastic, but our faucets are brass um, and they will cut in. So you have to make sure the faucets are going in nice and straight and not crooked because you'll strip that bulkhead fitting. This is just in case you ever need to take your faucet off or if you make additional barrels because your faucets will already be on your barrels when you receive them. Now, one of the extra steps that you could do is adding a bead of the caulking around the gap between the bulkhead fitting and the barrel. We did not do this for you uh, for, the safe, for the sake of saving on materials, but you can do this only if you, if you notice your barrel fills up and you're starting to get a little bit of a drip um, in that area. It's not enough to empty your barrel. It was just enough to annoy me. And all that really does is it just kind of gives you an add-in sealant on there around that bulkhead fitting. Because you have to remember these barrels are plastic. So as they fill up and as they you use it and as it gets cold and it gets warm, it's, it could be moving and shifting. So that extra bead of caulking will help around that faucet. Make sure your faucets are turned in the off position, righty tidy in this case. You don't want that faucet wide open and you get a rainstorm and then you're emailing me or Daniel saying, what did y'all do wrong with my barrel because I have no water in my barrel? Well, it might be because your faucet's left open. So our first step is asking everybody, is your faucet actually turned off so it's stopping the water? We don't normally hear back from them at that point. So make sure that you turn your faucet in the off position to save that water. Now installing the netting around the five to six inch hole at the top of the barrel, we put the caulking around the opening of the barrel um, and we put a generous amount. The generous amount is like what you see here, not half the bottle. We then put the netting on top of that and we start smearing outwards. And we wanna make sure that wherever that netting is in contact with the barrel, we have caulking to adhere to the top of the barrel. All edges and corners are not flapping up because that could loosen up and come off over time. So you wanna make sure all those corners and those edges are adhered down onto the barrel. And it looks something like this. Looks hideous, you can see all that white. Um, it will dry clear. The key to this is also not to smear the caulking over the opening of the barrel if you would like to collect water into your barrel, only where the netting comes in contact with the barrel. Now, one extra step that you could do, if you remember the uh, picture I showed you of the cedar wax wing birds using the rain barrel as the bird bath, these barrels were not designed for uh, rainwater harvesting. We are repurposing them for rainwater harvesting so that they do not end up in a landfill. But these lips and these edges are used for them to pick up and move these barrels. But that can also act as a pooling effect. So what you can do, like I've done in my barrels, is you can do diagonal drilling um, from the, the, the lip of the barrel, not back into the barrel. You don't want to open up the barrel. You just want the top to where it drains down the side. You, when you get your barrels where you pick it up around that rim, you'll feel where I'm talking. There's actually a ridge that doesn't go back into the barrel. You can drill what's basically like little downspout drain holes uh, for that water to drain off of your barrel. Again, we did not do that ourselves for this class because that takes up quite a bit of time for us to do that. About five to six holes will typically drain the top of your barrel. Now, what do you see wrong with this picture? We don't actually connect the barrels to the downspouts. We do not, what is preventing a mosquito from going down that downspout into that barrel and laying its eggs and then flying back out? What is preventing a squirrel from going down there because it's thirsty in 105 degree weather and getting stuck and cannot get out of there? This is why you want your barrel to be its own closed system. You can see here they did the same to convert a uh, diverter, but it's sitting on top of the barrel to pour the water in. This picture is great because side by side you can actually see the downspout where it used to be versus where they disconnected it and put the uh, diverter on there. 
Now, if you don't have seamless gutters and downspouts, this makes it really easy because your gutters and downspouts are just put together with little screws. You unscrew that and the whole downspout kind of pops right off. That is where you can attach a uh, diverter like this. Now, if you have seamless gutters and downspouts, you're gonna have to get yourself a hacksaw because you're gonna actually have to cut through your downspouts because there's nowhere to disconnect them. Uh, please wear gloves, be very careful. This is like cutting a Coke can, it will be very sharp. Um, and I don't want you to hurt yourself, but you are gonna have to shorten your downspouts because your barrels are three feet tall and we're gonna request that you raise them about 18 to 24 inches. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're doing this. You can see here where it's repurposed the same downspout material, but where they cut it off, they put the um, elbows back on there so that they didn't have to use a downspout diverter. Uh, this is a really great one. They've actually connected two downspouts to feed into their rain barrel, two center blocks high. It's beautifully done with the wood wrapped around it. This is actually somebody who's attended our rain barrel program. And then rain chains. Rain chains are growing in popularity, uh, not just aesthetics and sound, um, but also because some people don't have gutters and downspouts. And I'll show you a great way that you can use a rain chain if you don't have gutters and downspouts. So here you can see that um, they've actually disconnected the downspout, the middle picture, and they put the rain chain in. So where the downspout would have gone back into the siding of the house and then down to the ground, they disconnected and it's out away from the house and the rain chain actually hangs from that. The picture on the left, these are ones that did not have gutters and downspouts. They put a splash guard there. So as the rain comes through their valley of the roof, it's being redirected to the rain chain and down into their barrel. So you can do this even if you don't have gutters and downspouts. The picture on the right is one that I did years ago where they cut the tops of the wine bottles off, flipped them upside down and ran a chain through them. And the water travels down the chain or down the rain barrels into the chain. And all the bottles were donated for that project. So here's a video of the uh, rain chain in action. And if you look off in the background, you can actually see it is not pouring down rain outside. This is just a sprinkle. And look how much water is going down into that barrel. This barrel start was done filling after eight minutes um, on the rain barrel. Um, it started raining a little harder, but look how much water is going down that, um, that rain chain into that barrel. We're getting a lot of splashing too, and that's one of the things you will get with some of the rain chains. Now overflow, uh, just like what was asked earlier, you can see the picture in the middle is a great example of what we don't want you to do. Uh, look at the amount of water coming out of that downspout. I don't know if any of y'all were like Daniel and I as kids um, and where we used to be those kids that played in the rain as it was coming down and playing in the downspouts and the gutters and things. Um, you think back at when it was raining, how much water was coming through that downspout. It's a lot. Of, it's a high velocity of water and that will overflow your barrel very quickly. But if you don't have a good pitch or a good draining away from your home, too much water at your foundation like you see in this picture is just as bad as too little water. It can actually start causing washout um, in your foundation to start slipping. So if you don't have a natural drainage like I do, most new homes, your drainage easement is between the two homes. You do have a natural drainage away from your home. What happens then is the water just overflows out of your netting, down the side of the barrel, and then away from your home. But if you don't have that, you can see in these pictures how they've connected the picture on the left an additional larger drain pipe, and they can redirect the water away from their home. The one thing you don't want to do is you want to make sure that this pipe is also has some type of netting um, or uh, something to keep rodents and things from going up into that and into your barrel. You still want to make sure your barrel is a closed system. But this way, when you put that overflow at the top of your barrel, you can redirect that water away from your foundation and away from your home. I've had several people say that they did rain barrels. They redirected their overflow to go into a pond, a koi pond or a water feature. So all that added extra water was filling up their water feature and their, their ponds. Um, and that's one great way to do the overflow. Now, you can see here, many of y'all are going to realize one barrel is not enough. Two or three barrels may be good. Going above that may be too much, and that may be where you need to look at doing a larger cistern. Connecting rain barrels can be very easy. Just like in the overflow pictures you see here, you can connect those rain barrels by using the overflow. As you see in this picture, these rain barrels, I'm going to use my mouse now, this barrel right here is getting, the green barrel is getting the downspout to fill up the rain barrel. It overflows then into the brown barrel, which then overflows into the gray barrel. 
If you do this system, you have to make sure there is a faucet or an exit on all three barrels because the water will not travel back up and across for you um, if you uh, use up one barrel. The other thing that's bad about this system is what about the foot? Look how high the faucet's on there. These faucets were put on too high. They're not getting the water below, um, and that's why we would want those faucets about two to three inches off the bottom of the barrel. Connecting barrels at the bottom using a very similar system, you can see here they repurposed old water hoses going between the barrels. You can actually have three barrels functioning as one, where they will fill up and lower together with only one exit, but that's only if they're connected at the bottom. Again, if you connect them at the top, exit on every single barrel. You connect them at the bottom, then you can just have one exit as a whole. Six barrels, one downspout, all connected at the bottom with one exit. So you can see here in this system, you can use our barrels with the faucet attached at the bottom, and you can run hoses between each barrel by and connect additional storage without actually connecting an overflow onto the barrel. This is another great one where they connected the overflow uh, piping at the top of the barrel. Again, there's a faucet and exit at the bottom of each barrel. This one's another one that's connected at the top with uh, the downspout pouring into one barrel. This one's a great one. There's no need to lower one barrel over the other. They can all be equal in height, but they used a very similar system that we have where they have the faucets and they've run additional. But what they've done is instead of just having the one faucet exit, they have the splitter faucet that has the two faucets, and then they can run hoses between them. The key is to make sure in this case, all your faucets are open except for the one exit. You want to make sure that one is closed. That way the water can travel between the barrels, but you can get the water out at the end. Now, 16 barrels, two downspouts. This is what we don't want you to do. <laughs> this is, a again, a healthy addiction, but if you get that bug where, oh my gosh, you get to four barrels and four barrels isn't enough, that's where we need to graduate you up into a larger cistern um, to where you can harvest more water safely. When I look at this picture, I just look at all the points of failure, how many pipes and connections could come loose, you lose the water, how many squirrels and mosquitoes might be getting into those barrels. I just see so many problems wrong with that one. So uh, increasing the height of your barrel by an initial 12 to 18 inches. This is where cinder blocks are very inexpensive, readily available. Um, uh, option to raise your barrel. The reason for that is number one, you want to make sure that you can get the water out of your barrel, that you have access to it either by a watering can or a water hose and it's not sitting flat on the ground. The other thing is we're, by increasing at 12 to 18 inches, you're increasing the pressure. Not anymore after 12 to 18 inches, so we really don't want you to take it any further than 12 to 18 inches. But what it does is when, and what do you see wrong with this picture? This is 24 inches. Well, actually this might be more than that. Um, this might be 36 inches tall. This is creating a liability for yourself. And there's no reason to elevate it that high because a 55 gallon barrel completely full at over eight pounds a gallon of water is going to be very heavy should it fall on somebody or your precious plant or something like that. So don't create a liability for yourself. You're not even gaining one PSI by elevating at this additional um, 18 inches on your barrel. So 12, uh, 12 to 18 inches is usually enough. Two center blocks high is normally about 12 to 18 inches. You can see in this case, they even strapped the barrels uh, to the wall for safety. Um, and they have the overflow at the top. So this is a really nice system right here. This is a nice wood stand. It's probably a little higher than 18 inches, but nice and sturdy and solid. Um, and the rain barrels um, are easily accessible. And depending on your budget and what you want to do, I found this picture on Pinterest. I thought it was very interesting the way they did this, utilizing those four by, I think these are two by fours. Um, and they've uh, just kind of glued them all together to make this nice stand. And depending on time and budget and what you're willing to do, this is two barrels hidden inside of uh, material that could be easily blended into your fence out of sight, out of mind, uh, to where you don't have to see it if you're one of those people that don't want to see it. So increasing your barrel, just remember this, every vertical foot of water has 0.433 PSI. So if the room that you're in has one foot of water and your rain barrel has one foot of water, each one of those has 0.433 PSI. Your rain barrel full at three feet has 1.3 PSI. By elevating it that initial 12 to 18 inches, we've doubled that to 2.6.
Any foot above that, you're only gaining 0.433. So you'd have to take this rain barrel how many feet up in the air to get 30 PSI. But it also tells you why water towers are as tall as they are because it's that vertical drop, that vertical foot of water that gives us that pressure. A lot of our drip tubing and uh, 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 soaker hoses do work off of rain barrels, not to manufacture standards because they do need typically need 15 to 25 PSI. So it just means you have to run them a little longer. And there's certain drip that you can't do, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Getting the water out of your barrel, uh, most common for me on my barrels because one barrel is designated for indoor plants, one's for a water feature, one's for the greenhouse, is just a watering can. Um, I have a short hose like you see in the left picture that I can fill up my watering can with and utilize wherever I need it. Now, if you want to use drip tubing, we do recommend you buy this $12 part. Um, it's called a drip filter. Some people call it a Y strainer. It actually just filters out some of the larger particles that could get into your barrel. And from there, you're able to run your drip. Now, the drip that does work off of a rain barrel is like what I call micro drip. It's quarter inch tubing drip. There's also point or soaker hoses that will work. Not a fan of soaker hoses because they just don't last. If you really want to buy more soaker hoses, go ahead. But if you bought the drip tubing, it would last a lot longer. And point source drip tubing, like you see here, is half inch tubing and you actually put the emitters exactly where it needs to go. And those will all work off of a rain barrel. The one drip tubing that will not work off of a rain barrel without the use of a pump is what's called inline drip tubing. Half inch inline drip tubing, which you typically see in landscape beds all over, is uh, designed to build up equal pressure throughout all the tubing so that each emitter is putting out the same amount of water. You're not going to get that with a rain barrel or a rain cistern without the use of a pump. Submergible pumps, you can do them if you want to. I don't really care for it because um, this is really more off of our old rain barrel system where we could remove the whole lid. If you have it, it's still an option. We like transfer pumps. Um, a lot of people call them transfer pumps or external pumps. These, aren't been, uh, these are not designed to be left out in the elements. So you only bring it out when you use it, keep it in the garage or the shed. Otherwise, you attach it to your uh, rain barrel, make sure the water is open. You turn it on and it can pump the water down a water hose and drip tubing, build up more pressure for you, um, especially if you're running that water hose a long, uh, further distance. Uh, but you'll also, with the pump, learn how quickly that barrel will drain out. Now, what do you see wrong with this picture? Think about this really closely. What do we typically get with water and sunlight and clear tubing? We get algae growth, so kind of a greenhouse effect, if you will. The other side to that is the white barrels that we have that we're giving you do get some sunlight in them. But if you're using your rainwater, which we want you to do, then algae really should not be an issue. If your algae gets like this one in this picture, then you have become what we call a rainwater hoarder. <laughs> and you're trying to save that water for some other reason. We want you to utilize that water. And the great time to use water is before a rain event. If you know we're gonna have rain and the, the ground is pretty dry, putting water out on the uh, ground breaks that surface tension, kind of like dampening that dry sponge to absorb up more water. So use your rainwater, and that's when algae growth is usually not a big issue. Now, this is just going to show you, <clears throat> for those of y'all that don't want the white barrel, um, how you can change that. Uh, this is actually pictures of a rain barrel I did for my mother. She wanted a rain barrel for her indoor plants like we have. So I took our white barrels, and I took a uh, paint that was designed for plastic. Um, it is a black primer. Um, black was, a, uh, we did a research study years ago, was the one color that blocked out the most sunlight. Uh, other colors did not block out the sunlight. Even blue barrels, you might find blue barrels, still let in a significant amount of sunlight. But when we painted them black, it blocked out most of the sunlight. We primed it black. We were then able to go back over the barrel with the color my mother chose, painted the center blocks the same color. It matched the eaves and the trim of her home. Um, so it kind of blends in. She didn't want hers to stand out. She wanted it to blend in. No uh, algae growth, and it looks great. It's kind of hidden back in the back corner of her garden. So disguising your barrel, there's many different ways of doing it. You can see here these uh, individuals put like a shade cloth tart material um, over their barrel with a drawstring. They actually sewed it in and did all that wonderful work. 
Painting, if there's any artists out there that want to paint and disguise their barrels, wrapping them with wood is a, a fun way to do it to make it look like an old fashioned cistern. I still kind of laugh now. My dad loves old westerns. And if he has an old western playing on the video, and there's always a barrel like this one with a rope that they're cleaning themselves off of. Um, and I think of the rain barrels that people have disguised them with. You can hear they took old water crates and disguised it with fencing, doing a green wall and disguising them if you don't want to see them. Very helpful, especially for those of y'all that live within HOAs. A lot of great artists out there that have done some wonderful work on their rain barrels and sent us some very uh, fun pictures of how they decorated them. This was actually at the Dallas Arboretum years ago where they did a decorating contest uh, of rain barrels. <clears throat> this individual on the left was actually one that we did um, partnership years ago with Bell Helicopter. His last name is Barber. Um, and then the person on the left was uh, messaged us this picture and said, hey, I primed my barrel black and I actually kind of like that it kind of disappears behind my shrubs. Is there any problem with that? Absolutely not. Again, if you want your barrel to kind of just disappear in the landscape, this is one way to do it. Um, and they primed it black. They left it back there. It's in the shade. So algae growth is really not an issue. This person went to great time and expense to wrap their barrels beautifully done uh, with that wood. Um, so wood is a popular way of doing this and wrapping it. You can see different ways that they wrap that. A lot of fun ways. The one on the right is actually a wrap. Um, they went and had it printed out and wrapped their barrel. Um, so in, those of y'all that like the minions, there's a minion barrel. Uh, this person did send us their wood picture. They primed their or painted their top of their barrels black so that it would obstruct as much sunlight as possible and then wrapped it with wood. Um, and those are our white barrels. This is actually one from Southwest Airlines employees that decorated their barrels. Uh, the one on the right, um, actually their granddaughter painted that barrel for them. I thought that was very well done. And again, another person did their barrel black, said, hey, I kind of like it black. I'm going to leave it black. Perfectly fine. That is one of our white barrels as well. Now, the maintenance of your barrels from time to time, you may have to go and brush off debris off the top of your barrel, just keeping even maybe one of those old dust brushes or even your hand to keep that cleaned off. If any netting has any rips or tears, please replace it. Don't cause yourself a problem with big debris getting in your barrel, mosquitoes, rodents. If you do get a lot of algae in your barrel for some odd reason, you went on vacation for a month and you have a lot of algae, adding a tablespoon or so per gallon of bleach or vinegar will help with that algae. Um, there's algicides as well that you can put in there. Larvicides are something that a lot of people like to do just as a precaution for mosquitoes, because I will tell you, people have got, they have, uh, mosquitoes have gotten into their barrels before. And here's how they got into their barrels. Their gutters, like I talked about earlier, had a sag in them. The mosquitoes were still able to lay their little tiny eggs, but right after they laid them, a rain event happened. Those eggs then washed into those barrels. So here's our rule. Don't let the mosquitoes in and don't let them out. If they got in their barrel, they probably came from your gutters. So look up, look at the maintenance of your gutters if they need to be done. If you know we're going to have rain, use the water in your barrel. You'll get fresh water and you'll be able to break that tension on that dry soil. If your oaks are blooming right now, you might want to wait till they're done blooming, get those blooms off your roof. So those yellow blooms, the catkins, do not cause your water to turn acidic. So we really don't want your water turning yellow and acidic. Keep your gutters and your downspouts cleaned off. And if you know it's going to freeze, let out a little bit of water out of your barrel so it doesn't break or crack your barrel. This was actually a problem this last winter uh, with a lot of individuals in their barrels where their barrels actually cracked or broke. So you just let out a little bit of water. Remember, freezing water has to expand. Hopefully it'll expand out of your netting and not break your barrel. Now, for those of y'all that live within an HOA, we want to tell you a little bit about uh, Texas Senate Bill 198. 198 went into effect in September of 2013. What it was is it was the state telling HOAs, you need to get on board and let your residents do water efficient practices. Water efficient practices like composting, rainwater harvesting, efficient irrigation like drip irrigation, more drought resistant plant material, and more drought resistant turf. Um, so there are laws in place that allow you to do all these things. Um, but we're not here for legal counsel. If you want to know more, read up on the bill. Talk to your landscape committee or your management company to get more information. Also, online, you can look up and download a picture of the Texas State of Texas Sales and Tax Exemption Form. 
What this is, is if you are using, let's say you wanted to get gutters for rainwater harvesting or um, downspout diverters for rainwater harvesting, you can go and you can go sales tax exempt on that material. It does not include paint and wood to decorate your barrel, but it includes all the other components. So you can get that information tax exempt. At the bottom of the form, you'll notice that it says this certificate does not require a number it's why does the state of Texas need their own sales tax number, right? <clears throat> so what best advice we can tell you is most smaller hardware stores are, avail are aware of this. Go to customer service first. Let them know what you're doing because it's not a number they put in the system. It's a code. And so that and you'll see in here where it says tax code. So just let them know ahead of time what you're doing. Don't be that neighbor. We want you to get the healthy addiction about rainwater harvesting. We want you to get excited about it and watch the plants thrive in it. But don't be that neighbor. If you get to that point, it's time to graduate up to a larger cistern. So hopefully you all get that rainwater harvesting bug and you're going to want to do more. Getting your barrels, picking them up on Saturday, doesn't matter what vehicle you have. You can get those barrels home. They look more intimidating than they really are. I'm very proud of that smart car on the left because that was my doing, getting that barrel into that smart car. When you're putting that in, just be very careful of the silicone, uh, just in case there are cooler temperatures, maybe that uh, caulking at the top around the netting could still be kind of tacky or wet. You don't want to put that up against any fabric in your vehicle to where it might stick because it will not come out, the silicone. So just be cautious of that. Again, we are rooted in. We have very... Uh, quite a few different programs that we offer to you that we're excited to offer to you, as well as other services that you can go to our website on unrootedin.com, including design and consulting services of your private home. So please visit us on all social media, on our website, um, and come see us hopefully in person eventually. Uh, we'll be able to offer some more programming um, as the pandemic starts to subside a little bit, which we're all hoping it does. So that is the end of the program so far. So, Daniel, I'm going to open it up to some more questions. I believe we also had another question from Clark. Sure. Um, I'm that guy, you know, the one that always asks all the questions. <laughs> that's, no, that's okay. Great. You're fine. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier that we could um, um, get a consulting company for the, for the rain uh, gutter system. But do you guys offer that as well? I mean, is that something you guys do? Well, we can we can do a consulting as far as your rainwater harvesting system, but not the gutters. We're not Got so we you'd have to reach out to an actual gutter company then. Okay, and with regard to that, I mean, I didn't know that was uh, tax exempt. All like so we can if we're building a, our own barrel or a secondary barrel, we can just um, go into say Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever and just. Uh, show them the form or just tell them that we're getting it exempt or? Yeah, absolutely. That And that's where people have had the most problems is at the big box stores. That's why we yeah. recommend you go to customer service. And unfortunately, some of the stores didn't know what to do with it and they refused it. I hope that uh, doesn't happen to you, but take that tax exempt form and let them know you fill it out and you say you're doing it for rainwater harvesting. Worst case okay. scenario, ask for a manager. Um, and just say, you know, th this is tax exempt. I need to buy some guttering material for my rainwater harvesting, and it should be sales tax exempt. A lot of the smaller hardware stores, I know people have gone into True Value and Ace and places like that, and they've had no problem. All right. Well, you know how to reach us if you do think of a question or if you have one later on, reach out to us on our social media or our website. And we're happy to answer and do our best to answer that question for you.